So before we start Newton's laws out right here, um, I just want to kind of give credit where, where credit's due. So we all know Newton was the one who, you know, created gravity. That's a terrible way to say it, but um, he was one who, you know, wrote the law of gravitation. He was the one who wrote the three laws of motion. And, you know, you've all learned them in a, in a physics one setting, you know, in, and it's really, really dumbed down. And I encourage you someday to take a look at Newton's Principia. Uh, people say Principia, Principia, Principia. Um, so take a look at uh, Newton's Principia. It is, you know, something like a thousand page tome that he wrote in excruciating detail exactly how motion works. He was not someone who just like had an apple hit his head and said, hey, gravity. Like that is like the most insulting thing ever for someone of, of his like intellectual caliber. Um, he, and, and I think the biggest achievement he made more than the individual laws was that he was simply the first person to recognize that the universe is a simply mathematical being. That the laws of the universe are written in the language of mathematics. And that itself is a fundamentally game-changing idea. That before him, you know, if you look at the history of science, it was always like, well, there is this some heavenly being that moves the earth around, or things move due to some invisible, like, you know, magic. Newton was the first one that said, if it doesn't obey the laws of mathematics, it's not appropriate for our laws of the universe. And that's a huge thing because literally the rest of the semester, we're gonna be probing the laws of mathematics that govern the universe. Okay, so with that said, um, I'm going to fairly quickly go through law number one. What Newton recognized is that if there is no net force acting on an object, if F net equals zero, the object's acceleration is zero. Now, um, at this point, I don't feel like I need to define what a net force is uh, because really it's, you know, if you look at individual interactions, uh, the net force is simply the sum of all those individual interactions. Uh, I do think it's important to mention, though, that the way that I and most other physicists kind of define what a force is, it's fundamentally an interaction between two objects and only ever two. Like literally in, in the laws of particle physics, quantum field theory, you will only ever have two interacting objects, even at the tiniest particular scale possible. So it's an interaction between two objects. The effect of that interaction is to change those objects' motions, uh, unless there is some other offsetting interaction that prevents that. I hope that makes sense though. It's an interaction between two objects that changes those objects' motions. So that's what law one said. Basically, if you don't have a force, you don't change your velocity. Law two said, now, if F net does not equal zero, Newton told us how to predict what will happen now. And again, keep in mind, this is a mathematical prediction, which was not something that had been kind of recognized how powerful the laws of mathematics are until his day. So he said that if the net force is zero, we can calculate the acceleration. And specifically, if that's true, then the acceleration will be... Now, here's... Actually, I'm going to pause this. Don't just kind of like in your head write it up. Think it out. Put the terms on the right-hand side where they need to go. So, what two things will that acceleration depend on? Number one, the greater the net force, the greater that acceleration. I, I hope we all agree on that. You know, it's not like if we push harder, things move slower. You know, that's stupid. So, the greater the net force, the more acceleration. But, what thing resists the acceleration? By definition, the thing that resists any sort of change in motion is what we call our inertia, or more commonly known as our mass. So, Newton told us this. You can calculate that acceleration if you know both of those other two things. So, notice that I'm not writing this as F equals ma. I don't think that captures what the, what the words of the law mean. The words of law tell us if, if you have a net force, this is how we can calculate where we're going to be in the future. So, it was Newton's way of telling us what's going on in the future based on what's happening now. And again, that's something that was literally construed as magic at the day. And Newton said, no, it's mathematics. Um, I'll, I'll quit with that analogy there. Uh, but uh, law number three, now this is the one that I always uh, use a little more diagrams in class. Let's say you have um, any object A interacting with any other object B. It can be literally particles, it can be spaceships, it can be planets, whatever. 
Now, let's say A pushes on object B. I'm gonna call that the force that A applies onto B as a vector. Now, that's what those subscripts mean. The first one is gonna be the object exerting the force. The second one is the object feeling the force or receiving the force. And then the same thing. If A, it's all right there, F, A, B. And then if A pushes on B, now if B didn't resist that motion, so let's imagine that Tony A is here, he's pushing right. And then if Tony B is here, if I choose not to resist that force, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen there is Tony A's arms is, are just literally going to pass right through me as if I'm not even there. So the only way that there can be no response is if essentially I'm a ghost. Now, if I'm not a ghost, if Tony A comes and pushes me, my body is naturally gonna to wanna to resist that force. I'm not just gonna go flying. I'm, I might move a little bit, but if Tony A is not, you know, 10 times bigger than Tony B, what that means is the force that's applied onto me won't be enough to just swoosh me off into nowhere. I'm gonna resist that motion and gradually kind of just accelerate backwards based on my inertia. But what the, the more important thing there is that in like, I can't help, but so, so in the act of resisting that force and not just being whooshed away into nothing, in the act of resisting, I'm actually pushing back on Tony A. So Tony A is gonna push until I contact Tony B. I feel a resistance. That means that I'm gonna actually start getting pushed backwards myself. You guys all know this. This is the reaction force to the action force. If, as I, I did the wrong way there, but if I apply a force this way, this person naturally has no choice but to resist that and to push back because they have a mass. Their position doesn't want to change because of their inertia. So they push back when someone pushes on. And so Newton recognized in order for the laws of the universe to work, the force that the person B resists, and notice what I'm using, the resisting force is gonna exactly equal the original force, except it goes backwards. If I push against the wall, the wall pushes back. If I somehow was able to push harder than the wall pushed towards me, my hand would go straight through the wall. And I mean, that's literally, if you were to punch through a wall, you can do so because your arm is able to exert a greater forward force than the wall can possibly push back with. In that case, Newton's third law breaks and the wall breaks. <laughs> uh, and by the way, Newton's third law, third law doesn't break. Um, you just simply apply a greater force than is possible. And so it, it's a non-static situation, which is out of the realm of this class. Okay, um, so these are Newton's three laws of motion. And again, hopefully you've all seen this in many numerous fashions. I will say that this law right there is what is arguably the cornerstone of classical mechanics um, because as I kind of described it, it's a way of predicting the future. And you'll also see this written as, now I'm gonna to switch to camera B. Um, you'll also see the second law written as, um, let's see, X double dot vector is the net force over M. Same thing, you know, so, um, but in sort of, in doing any sort of, you know, um, simulations of, for example, like particle interaction simulations or universal simulations, um, you're always gonna use some sort of a, a differential operator here and we see them on the left side. So this is literally just a differential equation where the second derivative is related to the net force. Okay, and then finally, the, the last law that he put forth or the last, uh, not at all the last law, but the, the one that, that we typically include in this is the law of gravity and uh, this will be relevant for our work in this class here. And specifically, let's, let's describe the gravitational force between the sun and the earth. The sun, we say, is a mass of M, M sub sun. The mass of the earth is M sub E. And there is some distance D. I'll call it R, separating the two. And all Newton recognized was that the magnitude of the gravitational force between the sun and the earth is simply, and the way that we can sketch it out kind of from, with reason, without having to memorize this, what things will make the force greater? If you make either of those two masses greater, first of all, 
If you double that mass, it'll double the force. If you double that guy, it'll double the force. So each of those two is independently proportional. If you double the radius, the force gets cut into one quarter. If you triple the radius, the force gets cut into one ninth. If you quadruple it, the force gets cut into one, four, <laughs> one sixteenth. So um, that's a one over r squared. Doubling the distance quadruples. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that the wrong way. It cuts into one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, I should say. So this whole thing can be summarized as a proportionality. The two masses are linear, oops, linearly proportional or directly proportional. The radius is inversely proportional to its square. And simply the constant of proportionality is all it is. I'll just put it up here. Newton's constant 